to run comprehensive laboratory tests from a tiny sample or a few drops of blood to eliminate the tubes and tubes of blood that traditionally have to be drawn from an arm and replaced it with the nanotainer. Awesome. The youngest billionaire in the world. Mm -hmm. Is that heady when you hear that? You know, it's, it's not what matters. Um, what matters is how well we do in trying to make people's lives better. Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes has now officially been indicted on federal wire fraud charges. The U.S. Attorney's Office accusing her of engaging in a multi-million dollar scheme to defraud investors, doctors and patients. Former I don't have many secrets. Um, I don't have many secrets. Hey, what's up? So it seems that people liked my video about Anna Delvey that I did way back when. So today I'll be telling you about another fraud. And unlike Anna Delvey, this fraud didn't just fool the New York elite. She fooled Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, the people who run this country kind of elite. And she did it by pretending she invented this technology that didn't actually exist. Elizabeth Holmes was born on February 3rd, 1984 in Washington, D.C. She has an interesting family tree on her dad's side. There are a lot of very successful entrepreneurs, there's a few politicians, and her great-grandfather was actually a doctor who founded a bunch of hospitals. She also has a younger brother named Christian. When she was growing up, Elizabeth told her family that when she grew up, she wanted to be a billionaire. And the relative says, don't you want to be president? And she says, no, the president will marry me because I'll have a billion dollars. She was always interested in inventing things. And when she was seven, she actually drew up this time machine with like really complex engineering designs. She wrote her father a letter. What I want out of life is to discover something new, something that mankind didn't know was possible. I also want to study about man and his ways. Life is really interesting. I love being with you. It's my most favorite thing in the whole world. Love, Elizabeth. And when she was growing up, Elizabeth had an uncle who died of cancer. And Elizabeth was not close to this uncle at all. But later she would talk about his death when she was promoting her company. I remember his love of crossword puzzles and trying to teach us to play football. I remember how much he loved the beach. I remember how much I loved him. He was diagnosed one day with skin cancer, which all of a sudden was brain cancer and in his bones. He didn't live to see his son grow up, and I never got to say goodbye. When Elizabeth was in high school, her family moved to Texas, and she attended St. John's School. In high school, Elizabeth was really awkward. She had trouble fitting in, and she struggled with an ED, but she was very smart. She was into computer programming, and when she was in high school, she actually had her first business selling C++ computers to Chinese universities. And she was able to do this because by mid-high school, Elizabeth knew how to speak fluent Mandarin Chinese, which is a really difficult language to learn. Elizabeth's father did business in China, and he thought it would be good if both Elizabeth and her brother knew Chinese. So he got them both tutors, but Elizabeth was the only one who took it very seriously. And in high school, Elizabeth actually talked her way into the summer Mandarin program at Stanford University. This program was only meant for college students, but the professors were just so impressed by Elizabeth that they let her in. Part of the program took place in Beijing, and it was in Beijing that Elizabeth met Sunny Belwani. Elizabeth was 18 at this time, and Sonny was in his late 30s. He was already married, but he quickly divorced his wife and started dating Elizabeth. In 2001, Elizabeth was accepted into Stanford University, where, where she studied chemical engineering. 
and she worked as a student researcher and laboratory assistant in the School of Engineering. She also dated a guy at her college while she was still talking to Sunny. They were kind of on and off. At the end of her freshman year, Elizabeth attended the Genome Institute in Singapore, where she tested for SARS using blood samples and syringes. And at the beginning of her sophomore year, Elizabeth was SA'd at a party at one of the frat houses. And Elizabeth tried to turn to her mother for some comfort, but her mother basically told her to get over it and not to let it affect her life. And after this assault is when Elizabeth really started to pour herself into her projects. And she had a lot of them. One of them was this little patch she invented where you could wear it and it would put antibiotics in you and it could test your blood just from this little patch on your arm. In 2003, Elizabeth filed a patent for her little patch and she brought her idea to a professor at Stanford named Dr. Phyllis Gardner. And it's a terrible barrier to go across. And I kept saying to her, it's not feasible. And it just went to deaf ears. How did you, she respond? to the criticism. Just kind of blinked her eyes and nodded and left and then came back another time with the same sort of concept. It was just a 19 year old talking who'd taken one course in microfluidics and she thought she was gonna make something of it. Elizabeth was totally unbothered by this though cause she had a lot of other ideas. In 2004, Elizabeth dropped out of Stanford. I was at a point where another few classes in chemical engineering was not necessary for what I wanted to do. And used her tuition money to start a company called Real Time Cures. She had this idea of doing complex blood testing with just a pinch of blood from your finger. Elizabeth had been scared of needles since she was a little girl and she described them as torture devices. In a few months, she changed the name of the company to Theranos, which is a mix of therapy and diagnosis. And Elizabeth raised a lot of money for Theranos very quickly. She got Tim Draper, who is the father of one of her childhood friends, to donate. I ended up giving her her first million dollar check. And she actually raised six million dollars in the first year of the company from a variety of people, including media mogul Rupert Murdoch, the Walton family who owns Walmart, the Cox family of Cox Enterprises, Betsy DeVos, and former Secretary of State George Schultz. By 2012, Theranos had raised $92 million, and the board of directors was really impressive too. So it includes three former U.S. cabinet secretaries, two former U.S. senators, a retired Navy admiral, and a retired Marine Corps general, including George Schultz, Henry Kissinger. How did you make that happen? <laughs> None of these people had any background in science, but they did have a lot of government connections. General James Mattis also was part of Theranos, and they actually made up quotes and attributed it to him to make it seem like Theranos was involved with the US military. Elizabeth hired a bunch of scientists and engineers, but these groups were told not to communicate with each other. So when they would run into errors creating the machine, they couldn't figure out exactly what was wrong. How would you describe the culture of Theranos? <laughs> Justin? <laughs> Not a lot of camaraderie, a lot of paranoia. The office environment was designed to not really interact with anybody else. And they eventually told Elizabeth that this idea wasn't scientifically possible. But then they came up with this device called the Edison, which would later be called the Minilab. Elizabeth told investors that the Edison could predict whether patients would have a bad reaction to medicine, and it could also test for the swine flu and even cancer. And Theranos operated under a lot of stealth and a lot of security to hide the fact that the Edison didn't actually work. 
The employees weren't allowed to tell their families where they actually worked, and anyone who even came into the building had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. There were posts from employees. They equated it to a South American dictatorship or a drug cartel. Investors were not allowed to see the Edison, and they even followed the investors to the bathroom. And Elizabeth said that the reason for all of this was she was worried that another company would steal her idea. A lot of people were constantly quitting Theranos because they just couldn't get the machines to work. Hi, I'm resigning. Lying is a disgusting habit and it flows through the conversations here like it's our own currency. The cultural disease here is what we should be curing. I really truly believe you know it already, and for some reason I can't figure out you allow it to continue. Justin Maxwell. Elizabeth's boyfriend, Sonny, didn't actually join the company until 2009. First name is Ramesh, last name is Balwani. Most people call me Sonny. And Sonny was anything but Sonny. He would bark orders, he would degrade the employees, and he was definitely the bad cop to Elizabeth's good cop. If someone needed to be fired, which was often, it was always Sonny who did it. Sonny was already a millionaire from the dot-com boom, and he liked to show off his wealth with cars and the clothes he wore, and he bragged to the other employees that he had enough money to last him the rest of his life, and he was only at their nose because he wanted to help change the world. I knew this mission and what company was trying to do uh, was paramount. Uh, so I ended up giving a $13 million personal loan. In 2012, Safeway Groceries invested $350 million into Theranos. In return, Theranos would open these wellness blood testing centers in 800 of Safeway's locations. In 2013, Walgreens made a deal with Theranos so that their nose could do the same thing in 80 of their drugstores. Both Walgreens and Safeway wanted to see the labs before they signed the deals, but Elizabeth always had an excuse to why they couldn't. And these companies were just so scared of missing out on this new technology that they just took Elizabeth's word for it. Walgreens even hired an outside consultant who basically told these executives that their nose was not a legit company, but these executives were so charmed by Elizabeth that they went ahead and signed the $140 million deal anyway. Elizabeth held a big celebration to celebrate Their Nose's partnership with Walgreens. And around this time, the media started to take notice of Elizabeth. She gave a TED talk. She was on the covers of both Forbes and Inked. She gave lots of interviews. All the time. <laughs> and um, I'm basically in the office from the time I wake up and then working until I go to sleep every day. And Joe Biden actually visited their nose and he called it the lab of the future. President Obama appointed her as Global Ambassador for Entrepreneurship. I think the opportunity to um, try to connect with especially women and young girls in developing economies around what only because of this country I've been able to do, which is as a young girl start a business, drop out of school, and, and try to make a difference in the world. Forbes recognized her as the world's youngest self-made female billionaire, and at this point Theranos was valued at $9 billion, and Elizabeth started getting fan mail from female scientists who really looked up to her. 
In these interviews, you also might have noticed Elizabeth's voice. And as someone with a strange voice myself, I can tell you it might just be the way she talks. And her family says it is the way she talks. But a lot of people say it's a fake voice that Elizabeth puts on to sound more authoritative and masculine since she's in a male-dominated industry. I think it was at one of the company parties and maybe she had a little bit too much to drink or whatnot, but she fell out of character and exposed that that wasn't necessarily her, her true voice. In this interview with NPR from 2005, we hear a very different sounding Elizabeth. No, it hasn't. Well, if I use traditional words to describe what we're doing, it's hard. When she came to me, she didn't have a low voice. She didn't? Nope. What was her voice like when she came like to you? It was just like a typical undergrad student. When you can also tell by looking at her that Elizabeth is a big fan of Apple founder Steve Jobs. You can see she's always wearing the black turtlenecks like him, but she says she isn't copying him and has been wearing black turtlenecks since she was a little girl. Although there's lots of photos of her as a girl where she's not wearing black turtlenecks. And actually, it was when some employee from Apple came to join Theranos they basically told Elizabeth that she had bad fashion and What's you wearing? You look poor. And needed a makeover. And it was after that that Elizabeth started wearing the black turtlenecks. Elizabeth was very curious about Steve's attire. And I explained to her that he was inspired by Sony's heritage of having Issey Miyake come in and create a lot of the line manager apparel. And then I think she went off and tracked down who Issey Miyake was, and the rest is couture history. Either way, Elizabeth was clearly inspired by Steve Jobs, or Steve as she called him. She copied his management techniques and used his quotes a lot. And when he died, she actually wanted to fly the Apple flag at half-mast. And in 2015, the positive news for Elizabeth just kept rolling in. She was appointed to Harvard Medical School's Board of Fellows, and she was named in Time's 100 Most Influential People. She was also given Forbes Under 30 Doers Award, and was named as Glamour's Woman of the Year. So in 2015, these wellness centers in Walgreens opened at 80 of their locations in Arizona and California, and they were promoted by these ads. Um, we really are an important part of our family because <clears throat> we really um, love you so much. Your health is really important to us. The kids adore you. There are no skiff cards, because nothing is more important than the health of those you love. But things weren't actually going so well. There were lots of patients who would get Theranos tests at Walgreens that would tell them they had some very serious disease. But then they would get tested at their doctors and find out that there was nothing wrong. There was Sherry Aker. She was a breast cancer survivor who got one of the Theranos tests at Walgreens to make sure that she was still cancer free and she got some alarming results. All right, this is the Walgreens where I had the infamous blood draw. They seemed to know what they were doing and that was that. But things take a really terrifying turn when Sherry gets her results. I will never forget that day. I saw that the estradiol amount was over 300. I also called my oncologist's office and the nurse called me back and she said, I am so sorry, that's not good. There could be a tumor growing somewhere. That's where your alarm buttons kind of uh, signal more because then you're saying, why is this value so abnormal right now? Did something happen between then and now? And am I missing something? The doctor recommends she go to a non-Theranos lab in order to get another test. It was about a week later, I got the call from my doctor and he said, congratulations, your estrogen is basically non-existent. And she contacted Theranos, but Theranos wouldn't speak to her. 
and Sherry's story is just one of many. And Theranos was about to fall fast because there was a reporter from the Wall Street Journal named John Carreyrou who received a tip from a medical expert saying that Theranos was a fraud and they had sources to prove it. There was Erica Chun who was a former Theranos employee and she said that when she worked at Theranos At what point do you start to think something isn't right here? I think the transition happened is when I started processing patient samples. So you basically start out with a base test. Yep. You put that base test in your machine just to say, okay, we know that it's working, we know that it's cleared. Exactly. And what happened? And it kept failing. I kept running it over and over and over. And how it was handled it totally blew me away. They took out data points and they said, oh, well, this is like the best two out of six, the way that we kind of average things. So you're you're saying essentially that you were cherry picking exactly. the information right. in order to make the information make sense. But the thing is, is we were still processing patients. Meaning those patients were taking information that you were providing to them and making medical decisions. Right. Their quality controls were failing at one point what seemed almost every day. It, it really ate me up inside. Another source for the story was Tyler Schultz. He interned at Theranos and was actually the grandson of George Schultz, who is on the board of directors at Theranos. There's also Rochelle Gibbons, who is the widow of Ian Gibbons, who worked at Theranos for a long time and was treated really horribly by them. And Ian actually ended up taking his own life. So Rochelle definitely blamed Theranos for his death and so she was more than happy to talk to the Wall Street Journal and tell them everything she knew. She started talking to me about all these investments, all the money that the company was bringing in. And he told me that he couldn't imagine why people were giving the company any money because there was no invention. There was nothing there. Eventually, Theranos found out about this story and they tried to intimidate the sources by sending black SUVs to follow them around. And they sent their powerful legal team after these people trying to intimidate them. They even created a rift between Tyler Schultz and his grandfather George because George was still a believer in Elizabeth and her technology. I'm really curious about the personal side of this. This is your grandfather, George Schultz, a titan of the 20th century, former Secretary of State. Your relationship with him got really rocky. At one point, you were communicating only through lawyers. What, what kind of cost did you face as an individual, as a grandson, in taking on this fight? Yeah, um, that was extremely tough. You know, this whole saga has taken a financial, emotional, and tolls on my relationships. And my grand the toll that I took on my grandfather's relationship was was probably the worst. Um, I mean, it it was it's tough to explain. Um, yeah. I had a few very out? honest conversations with him. Theranos also tried to threaten the Wall Street Journal. But in October of 2015, they went ahead and published the article anyway. The article exposed Theranos as a fraud and it was the beginning of the end for the company. So Elizabeth went on the TV show Mad Money with Jim Cramer. This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you. And then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this when we had sent them over a thousand pages of documentation demonstrating that the statements in their piece were false. But, um, but we're doing things differently and we're working to make a difference and that means people raise questions and, and that's okay. She said that the story was fake news, but it was too late. The damage had already been done. In 2016, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid banned Elizabeth for two years from owning, operating, or directing a blood testing center. 
Walgreens ended their partnership with Theranos and sued them. In 2017, Theranos was sued by the state of Arizona for selling false blood tests to the people of Arizona. By 2018, Theranos was pretty much worthless. The company had went from 300 employees down to just a few. And by the end of the year, those people were gone too. In June of 2018, a grand jury indicted Elizabeth and Sonny on multiple felony counts of fraud. So as Elizabeth's life was crumbling around her, she decided to still live her best life. She left Sonny and started dating 27-year-old hotel heir Billy Evans. They were spotted at Burning Man Music Festival in 2018. They got a dog together and lived in a luxury San Francisco apartment building. Elizabeth Holmes might be facing up to 20 years in prison, but she sure looks happy prancing around San Francisco. That's the disgraced tycoon and her fiance, Billy Evans, whose t-shirt says it all take a walk on the wild side. Hi, Elizabeth. I'm Lisa Guerrero with Inside Edition. We'd like to know if you had an opportunity to watch the documentary about you. We found Holmes living in a luxury rental building with her fiance, who is heir to a hotel fortune. Elizabeth, a lot of young women looked up to you, especially in tech. What would you have to say to those young women? She spends her days with her fiancé and their husky, Balto, enjoying hikes and taking long walks in local parks. Do you have any comment at all to the investors that say they lost millions of dollars because of you? A lot of people think it was heartless that you were partying at Burning Man when your company was closing its doors. She's traded in her black turtleneck for a more casual look. But as soon as these neighbors heard her speak, there was no mistaking that unforgettable voice. Is that Elizabeth Holmes? <laughs> I didn't know until she spoke. As soon as she opened her mouth, I was like, bingo, that is her. The boyfriend's family definitely didn't approve of the relationship. They tried to warn him that he was making the worst mistake of his life but they said it's like he was brainwashed by Elizabeth and he didn't want to hear anything they had to say. In 2019, Billy Evans married Elizabeth and they moved into a $135 million mansion in Woodside, California. In July of 2021, Elizabeth gave birth to a baby boy. Elizabeth's trial began at the end of August, and it was a total circus. There were people outside selling Elizabeth Holmes costumes, and it became a viral trend on TikTok. And these are her groupies, dubbed homies. They even showed up and supported her trial in San Francisco, looking just like her. Across social media, they are a phenomenon. Red lipstick. Adopting her signature style. Some, like Lindsay Leonard, even attempt to imitate Holmes' deep, one-of-a-kind voice. Give us your best impression. Oh my gosh, um, okay, here we go. Um, and that's what happens when you try to change the world. Wow, like you got the deep voice. I, yeah, you know what? I'm Affected working that. on it. It's n it's a work in progress. I'm Elizabeth Holmes. During the trial, Elizabeth tried to blame other people, especially Sunny. Her lawyer said that Sunny totally dominated her and made all of her decisions. And Elizabeth got on the stand and cried and said that Sunny abused her for years and that he controlled everything from what she ate to how she spoke, even what she wore. Elizabeth said that the only thing she was guilty of was being a little bit too optimistic about the future. On January 3rd of 2022, Elizabeth Holmes was found guilty of four of the 12 charges against her and she was only found guilty of defrauding the investors, not about actually the fraud she did against the patients. Right, another one said that, oh my God, you've got a dangerous pregnancy that can cause a miscarriage or, or um, is, is gonna miscarry anyway, right? Well, in those situations, a lot of times they then induce the miscarriage to, to not go through that pain, right? Turns out she didn't have anything wrong with the pregnancy. Oh. So. I mean, what she did to the average person was unbearable, no prosecution, because they're not powerful, so who cares? 
The reason she got prosecuted and, and convicted is because she dared to rip off other rich people. Her company was valued at $9 billion. She humiliated other rich people because they look like idiots. They all rushed in. Elizabeth faces up to 25 years in jail, but she's free right now because she's not going to be sentenced until September of 2022. Sonny Belwani is currently on trial. He pled not guilty and faces the charges that Elizabeth does. So we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, that is the story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. Thank you so much for watching. And let me know if you want to see more of these fraud type videos. But as always, I will see you very soon. Bye.